Hey, this is Justin Lum, investigative reporter for Fox 10 News in Phoenix, and I am joined by the Nate Eaton of East Idaho News, news director and journalist who has covered the Vallo Daybell case from start to finish. Well, almost finished. We are still not there. I guess you could say halfway there. But Nate, uh, just to, to catch up, we have not really debriefed on the verdict, on the whole trial. I mean, we talk all the time, but really just to get this out on the forum publicly and to pick your brain, pick each other's brain, just, you know, it's been almost a month now, you know, how, how are you feeling? Have, have things slowed down at all? Uh, that's funny you say that, Justin. I was just talking to a friend this morning and it, I think it for about two weeks after maybe three weeks, it was kind of like, not what do I do now, but you know, you go from an intense courtroom every day for six weeks doing the same thing. Verdict comes down Friday. You have the weekend. And then Monday I was back at work and it's like, ah, there is other news happening, believe it or not. So yeah, it, it, it was a weird transition program or transition period. I mean, we still have the, another court hearing coming up here on the 15th. Her attorneys have asked to throw out the verdict. Um, and have a new trial. I, I doubt that will happen. And then we have the sentencing. And I think at that point, at least with Lori's concerned, we then shift over to you in Arizona. We find out what's happening next. So mm -hmm. I don't know. What about you? Did it, did it take a little while to, to adjust back to quote unquote normal life? Uh, just kind of back on the, back on the wheel, I guess, just right back into the swing of things. Um, non nonstop. Obviously we have other stories that we cover. Uh, both me and you and, and, and our newsrooms, respectively. But, you know, the reason why we're talking today is June 9th, 2023, the three-year mark of investigators finding the remains of J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan. And just for people who are not experts on the case or avid followers, Lori Vallow convicted on all counts convicted of murdering her two children, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan, and conspiring in the murder of Tammy Daybell in Idaho. She is the so-called doomsday mom, the so-called cult mom, whose case and story really began here in Chandler, Arizona, and moved on to your neck of the woods and Rexburg, Idaho. Um, and now she is going to be sentenced for this on July 31st. And this is a case that really started off in uh, 2019. And here we are about four years later. So back to June 9th, 2020. Um, take me back to the moments. You knew something major was happening from your newsroom. And I'm sure there was a buzz. There was stress, anxiety. This was three years ago on this day. Yeah, wild. Uh, it's weird because the weather today is so similar to that day. Uh, I, I remember I was out on a run that morning. My daughter had just celebrated her birthday the day before. I was out on a run. And my phone started to buzz around 7, 7.30. Um, and uh, it was from people saying there's there's police at Chad Daybell's house. And uh, so I called, you know, a couple of police sources. And the very first one said, uh, Nate, this is very different than before. This is very different than past search warrants. And that's all he could say. And so I called up Eric, who used to work with me, and Eric lived about five minutes from Chad's house. And it was, again, before eight o'clock, I said, Eric, go get as close as you can. And he called a few minutes later when he was up there and he said, I can't get past. They've closed all the roads. So we knew this was different. Uh, before, we used to be able to go right up to the house and, you know, not into the house, but go across the street and set up cameras or whatever. So I'm trying to think of a way how can we cover this and find out what's happening? And none of my police sources were talking. So th this was, this was big. And I figured we could uh, use a helicopter. We've got access to a helicopter. And so I, I made a few calls and I said, all right, let's fly like at nine o'clock. I don't remember the time, but uh, I hurried and showered. I got to work. We went up in the helicopter, uh, not knowing what to expect at all. And I started going live just on Facebook and uh, we, it takes about, to get from our station driving to Chad Daybell's house, it's about 35 minutes. But in the helicopter, we were there in about 12 or 13, I don't remember. And I remember seeing all the roads around Chad's house parked with police vehicles. I saw the big FBI command unit. And I was expecting to see just aerials of the, the house. But instead, there were police all over the back 
part of the property and there was red or pink tape like gridded off there was dogs like cadaver dogs in the yard um and and they set up blue tents and and uh, obviously at that point it's like whoa they're focusing on the yard they're focusing on the property not that not inside the house so we flew for about i don't know 30 40 minutes came back to the newsroom eric remained on the scene i get back to the newsroom somebody calls and says chad daybell was just arrested we're like what and then they said we have video and so this woman sent us the video and sure enough you see chad in handcuffs and that was huge news and then the police held a, a tiny little i don't want to call a news conference but they made an announcement that remains had been found in chad's backyard uh human remains mm -hmm. and that was huge it was like one big thing after another and then uh we flew again over the house just to see if there was anything and this time there were more blue tents set up and then that night they held a news conference at the city hall and they did confirm that two sets of remains had been found. They didn't know who the bodies were, but um, eventually we found that out. And I just remember at the end of that day, Justin, it was such a whirlwind of a day. We had been waiting for so long to find out where these kids were, if they were dead or alive. And here on this one day, we got the answers or we assumed we had the answers and Chad Davo was arrested. And yeah, it's one of those days, June 9th, it's a day that, I'll never forget. I know you you won't either. Yeah, I'll I'll tell you guys now that um I I worked night side um and I worked weekends. I don't know exactly what the day was, but you know, I would sleep in a little bit more, you know. I I could get up in the morning and and not be rushed and I got a text from Brandon Boudreaux and he basically said FBI's at Chad Daybell's house. And that's when I started seeing what you were doing and what Eric was saying on Twitter and all that. And it was a nonstop day of just, um, you know, anxiety and kind of expecting the worst, sadly, um, and just trying to find as much information as we could. But on that helicopter ride, I mean, that is something that not a lot of people get to do. I've never done it. Just what was going through your mind as you did see what was unfolding, uh, you know, underneath you? Uh, I just remember... I, I didn't think that they would find bodies in his yard. I thought maybe they're looking for weapons or maybe they're looking, they're just doing a really deep search. I never in my wildest dreams thought that the remains of JJ and Tylee would be back there. It was unfathomable to, first of all, know that they're, they're dead. Uh, but then to know that they were so close to his house I mean, right there on the property. So I, I honestly wasn't expecting Maybe any news, you know, they've done other search warrants in the past where they didn't really say what had happened. Just we seized this, we seized that. So I thought maybe this, they'll do that. So I, it wasn't like it hit me that these were the kids until they announced it that day. And it was still crazy. And then the fact that the cops went back out there the next day to continue digging, because now we know the conditions of the, of Tylee and, uh, JJ, of course, but they had to, this took them two days and the roads were still closed. So I think it was just, you know, what, what is happening here? It's, it's such a twisted thing, but it also brought a lot of closure to that as far as where the kids were. Once we knew that, I think that was able to help move, move things forward a bit. Yeah. Such a pivotal couple of days, a pivotal week, um, as we know, because Chad would be arrested and Lori Vallow's child abandonment charges would be dropped eventually and the new charges would be filed and even then it was the concealment and destruction of evidence charges for for both of them and st still such a long wait for the murder charges uh, this revelation and the tragedy truly impacted the community that you're a part of that you live in do you feel like it was the news the people in the community all felt was coming at some point, but still not ready or expecting the type of details, the location and everything that we would eventually learn. I, I think that a lot of people thought the children were no longer alive, but I don't know if anyone ever would have thought they'd be buried in his yard. You've been to Idaho. You see how remote it is. You yeah. can drive five minutes from here and 
and dispose of something in the ground and have it never be found. I mean, there, there are a lot of places, sadly, this sounds morbid, but a lot of places to hide a body here in Idaho. So I think that was the most shocking. I think people were just so sad. I remember there was a vigil put on by strangers two or three nights later, and so many people showed up and it was just so sad, like this heavy fog of sadness uh, over the whole community that week that these kids who, you know, so many people hoped were alive were not. There were a lot of people that thought they were still alive. There were a lot of people that had a lot of faith in Chad still believed yep. him up to that point. Uh, and Lori, even, I, I, I know we heard those jail phone calls that even yeah. Summer, her sister thought maybe there was something and defended her and even Colby. So, so it was a shock to them. It was a shock to us. It was a shock to most people here. Uh, and, and then, but it also brought a lot of closure. I mean, imagine Justin, if here we were three years later, still wondering where those kids were, if, if oh, they yeah. had put that together we wouldn't have had a trial that we just had we wouldn't have chad's trial coming up so at least there are some answers and a lot of families in these situations don't get those answers yeah and and we had talked about that way back when like what if this is one of those you know five-year anniversary cold yeah. cases and 10 years and you just it always gets brought up uh, yeah. but that is not the case how did you i'm curious how did you debrief with your team and at the same time, as you guys are strategizing coverage for something so big, huge, not only following up with the court dates, but the layers of evidence and the information that was coming along. Boy, we're, so we're a small newsroom. You're and I small. Know. That's what I mean. That's what people I don't think they always, you know, it's a reminder how small you guys are. But also, too, Justin, you you. Did, I mean, you kind of, you obviously spearheaded this for your station without a doubt. I mean, I don't know how you could, you could probably pull the history of your search <laughs> history on your account and the Idaho courts websites probably right there at the top, like tw 20 times a day. Some days you're waiting for those court documents to drop. Mm -hmm. And sometimes but the public, you may not know this, that like that big Arizona dump, we don't really know when things are coming. In, in five minutes, we could get a huge data drop. And then it's suddenly whatever you're doing, pivot to that, yeah. which is kind of the, the, the nature of news. Um, so we, you know, we just kind of took it as it come. Luckily, I was able to work with Eric, who was really great at digging through data and dig through, digging through documents and helping us tell the stories. And I have great colleagues here who are willing to help and jump in whenever there's something. Um, you know, the trial was was big. I was there every day. You were there most days. And and that's that's an expense. And that's a a, a, a heavy lift when it's not in your local area to go cover every day. So um yeah, we just kind of took it as it comes, and it, it's hard to believe that we're going on four years now, and and we're still not even to the to the Arizona portion. But um, it's it's something that is kind of consumed all of our lives for a while. And I think it's actually a compliment to your newsroom, even though it's small. It's almost better that you know you have a handful of people or several people that you're like, okay, everyone knows what they need to do. I don't need to call anyone else or you know go across the building like here we are let's do this so i think i mean obviously you guys have done it for so long now we you know we fast forward through the, the grand jury indictment you know the mental competency of Lori and the delays that we had for trial the camera ban but you know right to the trial you know you were there every single day not everyone i, I wish i was but you were not there every single day i mean you were there every single day i'm sorry would you call this the biggest assignment of your career Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt, by far. Uh, yeah, this whole story, without a doubt. And I don't think anything will ever top it after this. I've covered, I covered the execution of the DC sniper back in Washington. I didn't actually see it. I thought that was a big story. I've covered other things along the years, but as far as time and effort. And also, uh, and, and I know we've talked about this, Justin, you kind of feel you want to see this through the end. You, we were you were there from the beginning. You want to see it through the end. And obviously there was a public interest in it. So yeah, this, this was without a doubt by far the, the, the biggest thing. And, and I think it does help to talk about it after because there was a lot of horrible stuff with that trial, you know, and it helps to talk about it and, and talk to other people and discuss it. Um, wouldn't want to do it again. Of course, we might have to do it again with Chad, but uh, 
I, I ha my hat goes off to everybody who covers courts consistently. I'm able to do a variety of things and mm -hmm. some reporters, that's all they do. So yeah, it was, it was, it was quite an ordeal, a, a time that I'll never forget. Pretty, pretty grueling. Um, what stood out to you from either a witness, um, evidence, or or just how the prosecution and the defense did their jobs? It, what I think really stood out, several things stood out to me, but one of the things is how well it appeared the prosecutors were able to juggle 60 witnesses and not, and keep the case going there, there. I don't want to say there were boring moments, but a lot of times in trials, there can be boring moments where you get real technical. Prosecutors did a good job of putting on a real personal type witness like Summer or Colby or Audrey Berterio, and then putting on an FBI guy who might be more technical and the jurors might zone out and then going back and forth. So the way that they presented the case, I think went well. I, it what stood out is also that the defense didn't have much I, because of of Lori not wanting to have much of a defense, um, and that well they didn't have any defense really. But even their cross examining they didn't have much. Um, stood out to me that Lori, Lori was Lori. We, we've seen her in court before. She didn't change much. Uh, the moment I won't forget sitting by you when that verdict was read, I was surprised how emotional it was in that courtroom. I mean it was. That hour when we got the notice that it's coming and mm -hmm. till, till the time it came, there was this buzz, this electricity. I mean, it was, you could feel it. And then afterward yeah. walking out. Um, and then other key moments like the autopsy photos, the phone calls, the uh, emotional testimony of Brandon and Kay and others. There, there's a lot of moments that, that I, I don't, I won't forget. Yeah, we what stood out to me, I'll get to, to the prosecution, but we knew there was going to be massive amount of evidence, whether it was data, photos, the calls. Yeah. Um, and there would be a personal insight and emotion with these witnesses. But I have to hand it to Lindsay Blake, lead prosecutor, who just through everything. I mean, she she brought it from the beginning with the opening statements and establishing the theme of motives yeah. uh, that they were trying to um, explain to the jury, money, power, and sex. She hammered that home and explained why they were going to see money, power, and sex as, as motives. And then throughout the trial, you saw those themes come up through their, their arguments and, and, and the witnesses that they brought on. And yeah. we know that she had some some family issues and she just was strong she was just really strong through, throughout the whole thing um and she brought a different sort of energy for the prosecution obviously everyone did their jobs you know rob wood rachel smith but um that, that stood out to me really just from the beginning there was a, a consistency and you saw you saw the strategy and the logic of what they were doing um yeah. you know you met so many people there throughout the six weeks you met so many people in court from the public people that were logging on to get their tickets each day before the next day, uh, podcasters to other journalists from all over the country. Um, you've been doing this a long time. How has media coverage changed on this type of thing? Oh man. I, I, if, if we had been covering this 15 years ago, I don't know really how we would have covered it. We covered it at East Idaho news because I was able to tweet every second if I wanted and post an updates on our website, I post an update every second as well. So we were constantly feeding out information because there were no cameras in there and there was no live audio. So people wanted to know what was happening. And so that, that has changed the fact, the immediacy of it. And the fact that there were these, these people that ran YouTube channels and podcasts that they started in their own homes or offices that came and spent their own money to be there and would go live during lunch or after after the trial and uh very nice people wonderful people um and that's changed and and there can be sometimes you know people would see stuff on social media that was not true about the trial and then you know they'd message me and you we saw it or tag us on twitter and be like mm -hmm. what about this and you and I knew, well, that's not true. That's, that didn't happen. And you, you, 
you want to keep it straight to the facts, which is what we do and not speculate while we do know a lot of stuff behind the scenes and off the record. So yeah, the, the media, media was big. Um, you know, there were national networks there every night. News nation was there every night reporting on it and, and others. And, um, it's, it's changed, but I, I appreciate all the viewers that came. I thought, Justin, over time, the interest would go down a little bit. But every day at 8.02, those tickets were gone to go in the courthouse. Mm -hmm. You had to get on 7.59, refresh, 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 8 o'clock, hope that you get a seat the next day. And fortunately, I was able to get a seat every day. But I think over time, the interest only went up, that more and more people were coming. And then when they said it was first come, first serve for the verdict seats, a lot of people came out. And speaking of seats, I just came to my mind. Remember, it seemed like such a big deal at the time when people thought that you weren't going to get a seat for closing <laughs> arguments. Was it, it was for closing arguments. Yeah, yeah. My colleague. I'm sorry about help. that. Now that we're, we're here on the record, I was trying to get my seat. Um, and people were asking about you as well. And everything worked out. Because Justin was being very nice. He wanted he wanted to make sure he got a seat. He was driving all the way from Arizona. Both of us that morning did not have seats. Yeah. We tried to get seats, and and a lot of other people didn't. I don't know if there was a glitch, but something happened. We didn't get seats. Yeah, Justin uh, was nice and put it on social media, and then said that I didn't have a seat. And so many of you wonderful viewers started calling our newsroom, started calling the courthouse to say get them a seat. But it all worked out. We got in, and we were good. I, I had no shame in, in asking if anyone will help out because I mean, this was, you put so much time into this yeah. case and it's like, okay, I need to figure out something. And if, and if worse comes to worse and I had to be in the overflow room, like that's fine. But um, somebody really nice uh, came through and I, I appreciate her um, yeah. and, and you made it in and it was all good. But um, back, back to Lori, a couple of times, maybe a few times, we had talked about she seemed to glance in our direction or in our area. She didn't really pay much attention to the middle section of the gallery all the time because, you know, we're, we're family members of, of the victims were and she would just look towards her, her attorneys. But do you think you learned anything new about her in some way in those six weeks? Um, I... Uh, I'd love to talk to Lori. I, 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 I would love to talk to her. I, I don't know if she'll ever do an interview with anybody, but yeah, I do believe that the tears during some parts of the trial were genuine. Um, I don't think that before she saw the autopsy photos in court, I don't think she had ever looked at those. I think she had the chance to, I think her attorneys likely would say we have them. I don't know if she would have looked at them. Uh, I know some people think she faked the tears. Maybe she did. Maybe she did. And maybe you're right. I I personally don't think that. Um, I think that mental illness is a factor here. Uh, I don't know the, the level of it, but I think there obviously is something there. Just watching her, thinking something's not right here. Mm -hmm. uh, not that, that that's an excuse. There are a lot of people who are mentally ill who don't kill their children, obviously. Um so I don't know if I learned anything new, but it was fascinating to see her every day walk in and smile and laugh and joke and uh, just be there. And, uh, you know, it, it just kind of became normal. My wife said she was surprised how thin she was, how little she was. My wife came one day to the courthouse. Mm -hmm. uh, other people who came said that when they she walked in, they felt kind of an evil feeling, you know, just dark something yeah. like that. So I don't know, maybe I've gotten used to seeing her because I've covered so many hearings where she's been there. There has been other hearings where she uh, turned around and kind of smiled and she kind of waved at one. Were you there the, just in the one day she turned around and looked, wasn't it me and you, right? She looked right yeah. at us. And, and you were telling me like, dude, she, she just looked at it. It was really quick. Like I didn't even catch it. Yeah. Um, but there are other times where it seemed like she was looking in the direction. Um, not that that's like, oh, my God, some some big deal. But I think the fascination, sure. what we're talking about, it's like there's this invisible glass between us and where her her table was. And just trying to study her and watch her mannerisms and her reactions to this huge case and, and all the evidence. And she didn't seem to show too much emotion when the graphic photos 
were displayed. She didn't want to look. She didn't want to be there, right? She motioned for that. She would look away. She kind of have her hair covering her face. Maybe it was more of an anger or being upset, but there was no sad emotion or remorse. But when she did look like she was sad and, and really uh, bothered was when, you know, closing arguments had finished up and, and her defense made her out to be the victim of Chad Daybell and that she was a follower of someone who was allegedly making things up as he went on. And she something did not sit right with her about her what, what they said. And she had no idea of what was going to be brought out to the jury by her defense, which really wasn't much, you know, that no, no witnesses, you know, just some cross-examination and, and she didn't testify, but yeah, that's, that's what I learned about her is the things she got emotional about. It was interesting of what, of what she chose to, to but do. I think about it, Justin, they really could have gone after Chad this entire, you know, the, this entire mm -hmm. thing, every single witness, they could have turned it back around and said, Chad's property, Chad's property. Alex, Alex, Alex. They didn't do that. So at the one time they did, uh, Jim Archibald called Chad's books stupid and said weirdo beliefs. Yeah. She was upset. She was mad. You could see it. She was in mm -hmm. tears. She was so angry at him for doing that during closing arguments. You compare to her behavior to Chad when we've seen Chad in court, he's not looking around the room. He's not looking at people in the audience. He's mm -hmm. not smiling. He's not joking. He is very neutral, looking straight ahead, no emotion at all. A couple times he's giggled like very stoic. Guest. Yeah. So, so just different based on other defendants that have been in other courtrooms. But yeah. I think this is par for the course for her. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, though, we, we know it's about justice for JJ, Tylee, and Tammy. Still another trial to cover with Chad in April of 2024. Yeah. Do you expect to see anything different, really? If it goes to trial, yeah. if it actually goes to trial, I think it will be very different. One, you have John Pryor, who's okay. the attorney, and I think he will be much more fiery, you could say, than the, her attorneys. I know there's more evidence that hasn't been presented that will be presented in Chad's. A lot of it will be the same. Um, he's facing an actual murder charge for Tammy, whereas Lori just had the conspiracy I think it will be longer because it's a death penalty case. So there's the, the bar is higher. And then there'll also be a penalty phase if he's found guilty where the jury will have to decide if he gets death or not. So I think that there'll be enough new stuff there that it'll be different. But I also think there'll be a lot of stuff we've already heard. And then the big question is, will it actually go to trial? At this point, once he's read all the transcript and listened to the testimony, will he say, okay, I'm going to do a plea agreement? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if so, if it does go to if it does go to trial, uh, cameras, you know, will cameras be let in? That's a, another question. Everyone asks us: to, Is it going to be televised, broadcasted, streamed, all that? So that is still yet to be determined, of course. Now let's get to next week, a little quicker coming coming up. Or I should say, you know, depending on when you watch this, but June fifteenth, right? Lori Ballow's motion for a new trial. Her attorneys say the jury was misdirected by language in the indictment regarding the, the term conspiracy, saying that it was believed for, for about two years that at least five people were involved in the conspiracies. We know about Lori, Chad, and Alex, Alex Cox, Lori's late brother. So, so you know, who, who are the two other people they may be talking about? I'm curious to see if Jim Archibald elaborates on, on that on, in the hearing on June 15th. That will be interesting. And he's kind of raised that point before because the indictment is so open-ended. We didn't hear any reference to any other co-conspirators during the trial. Mm -hmm. None. But it was brought up. Three. Other than other than Alex, we we yep. knew that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think this I don't based on multiple attorneys and even some judges I've talked to about this motion. I don't foresee this judge throwing out the verdict. It mm. would be huge news if it did. And then you better pack mm. your bags, Justin, because you're coming back to Idaho. And also, I think that if that did happen, the judge would rejoin Lori's trial with Chad's. I think that you would see them both happen at the same time again. But that is that is, I, I, I really don't foresee that happening. I think yeah. this was more of a procedural type filing that most attorneys file. They have a, a two week window. They have to file this. They filed it. Judge Boyce will probably deny it. And then we'll go into the yeah. sentencing, which will be next month.
we we expected it, but it was the reasoning that you is curious. Oh, well, what's their reasoning? And and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but you were basically brought up in the motion. You and the interview you did with juror number eight, it was brought up in Archibald's team. They basically referred to it and and and, and basically an excerpt of it implying that the Arizona law enforcement evidence brought in regarding Charles Vallow's murder, which Lori's fourth husband, Charles Vallow, that it confused the jury somehow. But you've talked to Saul multiple times now. It doesn't look like he misunderstood the jury instructions at all. What'd you gather in the second interview to, you know, basically clarify everything after this motion? Well, yeah, thank you for asking that because a lot of people have said, do I regret the interview? No. No. I would do it again. Anybody, any journalist should want to interview a juror after the mm-hmm. fact. So um, I had had a long dinner with Saul the night before for three or four hours where he told me that after the trial, he watched Dateline and he looked clips up online. So the next day in the interview, which was five days after the verdict, when I asked him, what what did you think about law enforcement? And he said, I think that there were some mistakes. I'm paraphrasing. He was referring to the Arizona case. Yeah. And then he, I mentioned the body camera footage. And I was referring to the day that Charles was like, she's crazy. She says I'm Ned Schneider. And he mm-hmm. nodded. The defense pointed to the, that exchange and said he knew about stuff that was not brought up in the trial. Well, then I followed up with him in the second interview, and he said, well, I knew about it because I watched it after the trial. I didn't know about it during the trial. And because he was free to watch whatever he wanted after the trial, he did. He was curious. He went and watched it. But he made it very clear in that second interview that he did not watch media, that the instructions were very clear, that they understood everything, and that it shouldn't be an issue. And he wanted to come out and address that. I think he felt uh, uh, not attacked, but he didn't want to cause any issues with the verdict. And so I was glad that he clarified that. And, and you know, I stand by the interview. I probably could have been more careful in clarifying the timeline, but I, now now that's why I'm talking to you. Definitely a good move that you did a follow-up right after that, and that he was open to it. Yeah. Uh, that, that, was, that was great. Um, now, we, we've spoken to several family members of the victims on the record, off the record for the last four years almost. You know, obviously, June 9th is not a good day at all. We know that it's the reality that two kids were murdered and their mother is responsible for those murders. She's been convicted. And we can now say that the jury believed she was guilty of using money, power, and sex as motives to kill her own children. It is now fact do you think it will ever make sense though to anyone that that this happened no unless lori somehow can give a rational reasonable reasonable reason maybe after the fact but that still won't make sense yeah i don't i don't think we'll ever make sense of it uh or maybe chad says something but that and that that's every every human wants that Everybody yeah. wants that. The, that we explanation. Can, yeah, the the why, but why? Where, and where would it have ended if mm-hmm. if um if they wouldn't have been arrested when they were and they ran out of money, then what? Do, is, does somebody else die for life insurance? Eventually the money ran that would have run out. Mm-hmm. So they figured maybe that the second coming would have happened by then and they didn't need to worry about money. Well, here it's 2023 and Jesus has not returned. So somehow there would have had to be something within the past three years. What would it have been? I don't know, but no, it, it won't ever make sense. And it, it's just so sad all around. I, I know the answer for this question for me, uh, it's yes to toughest story you've ever covered by far. Oh, yeah. 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 Me- you know, mentally, Easily. What, every, every single time I've tried to go on vacation during the past year, you, I, something happens. I was getting on a cruise ship with my family last two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Finally, I don't have to think about this case. Mm-hmm. And you texted me and said, dude, did you see the court documents about yeah. the jury, them wanting to throw out the verdict? And I'm like, oh. I felt bad for doing that, but. Oh, I'm know. glad you did. So then, <laughs> yeah, but then my phone died. I didn't have the cell phone service. So yeah. Yeah, it's just been it's just been consistent and and in a way though that's kind of what has kept me going. I'm sure you yeah. too just to stay on top of it uh, until the end, but yeah. Definitely it, exceptions, right? Like there's so many stories we cover and if we're we're off or we're 
with family, we know that, okay, well, it's fine. If something happened regarding this said story, like, it'll be okay. But there's something about this case where it's like, you almost drop everything and it, it feels bad because we're, we're, we have families and we have other responsibilities, but there's something about this where it's like, I have to, I owe it to myself and, and everyone to respond right away to whatever is happening. And it's been going on for four years now. So yes, exactly. We, we know how we feel on that. Uh, last thing, you know, to put it in perspective again on this day, this, this day that we're talking about June 9th, you, you've got kids like real kids run around the house watching cartoons every day kids you know the are we there yet dad kids that age it's a special time and i i say that because you know your daughter emmy's birthday is on june 8th you, you mentioned that so I, I hope it's not too personal but coming off such an amazing day in your life june 8th is always going to be special for you right in 2020 though celebrating her birthday and then the next morning you're flying above chad Dable's backyard where JJ and Kylie are buried, seven years old, 16 years old. How do you even absorb that as you're trying to do your job? Because it must hit home. Like that phrase actually makes sense. It hits home. Oh, without, yeah, that, that, that is a, a, a direct um, opposite of situations that I'll never forget. That was, that in 2020, we were in the middle of COVID and my parents were able to come up and see us for the first time in months for her birthday. So we had had a great day. Um, she got her presents. She was turning seven. Uh, and my parents were there. They had gone home the night before. It was just a really great summer was here. And then the next day, such a drastic situation. And, and JJ is was my daughter's age. And, and my daughter too, we tried to shield her from a lot of the cover. My kids just keep it separate, but she knew that's what I was doing. And I came home and she said they found the kids dead, right? Dad, I had to explain that. And then she wanted to come to the vigil a few days later. And I didn't know about that. I really thought, nah, I don't know. I, but she came, she came mm -hmm. and she had held a candle. And I remember seeing a picture of her. She wanted to, to honor them in her own way. So it's become a part of their life. Uh, a lot of the stories that you and I do, uh, families don't get involved. You know, things change day to day. We do something new every day, but this has become them too. It, it, it in a weird sort of way. Yeah. So that's part of the reason too, that it's so hard to comprehend, you know, sitting in court, seeing those awful things and thinking yeah. who, who, who could do this to a child. Mm -hmm. You can't help but think about your own. Um, honestly, there are things we separate. We're supposed to be objective, but you know, when you have family, it's definitely, it's tough, but um, hey, I appreciate you. And here we are four years yeah. later, three years from that day. Um, but as far as coverage and just everything that's happened in between, it's totally uh, been a wild, wild journey. So I guess Nate Eaton, everyone, thanks for thanks for joining the uh, this episode or whatever you want to call it. But I thought it was important to talk to you about it, you know, since it's been yeah. three years since today. Thank you, Justin. Good catching up.